Hello everyone, my name is Ben Philandes. I'm a fifth year PhD student in the Cognitive and Information Sciences Department at University of California Merced. That's me. And I'm excited to tell you about some of my research in collaboration with Paul Smolino. That's Paul. One way to think about culture is simply as sets of artifacts or behaviors which are acquired at least in part through social learning. These include things like tools, language, and folk tales. As we all know, artifacts may change as they're copied and reproduced. For example, the predecessor of this modern hammer include this Paleolithic hammer from around 33,000 BCE, and these hammer stones, which were used about 3.3 million years ago. But artifacts don't always become more complex as they're transmitted, nor do they simply mutate randomly. As an example of this, we can consider Bartlett's classic work from 1932. In one transmission chain experiment, Bartlett presented a first participant with the abstract image in the top left and asked the participant to reproduce it from memory. Then a second participant saw the image created by the first one and reproduced it from memory, and so on. As you can see, the abstract image is quickly transformed into a simple cartoon face, after which the general features remain quite stable. Work like this has been taken as evidence that individuals have particular cultural schemas that bias transmission towards culture-specific attractor points. A typical explanation of this effect might look something like this. The large red dots show cultural attractor points, and the white dots show individual artifacts. We can think of the x and y axes as corresponding to any featural dimensions of the artifacts. Each artifact may generate some number of descendants within an error radius due to noise in the copying and transmission process. The descendants that are closest to the attractor points have a higher probability of being selected for reproduction in the next generation. And eventually, artifacts end up clustered around the attractor points. But notice that this model treats cultural attraction as just another form of natural selection without actually explaining where these forces of selection would come from. This is an important gap in our knowledge because cultural attraction effects are crucial for the Darwinian evolution of culture. If individuals transform cultural variants in random ways, cultural transmission will be unreliable. That means there's no cultural inheritance, which means no cultural evolution. Only when cultural variants cluster, meaning when we find evidence of cultural attractor points, can they compete as distinct cultural phenotypes. So where do cultural attractors come from? Another way of asking this question is, what's required for different individuals to perceive, remember, and reproduce cultural variants in consistent ways? First, they have to have similar physiology. For example, humans can't possibly transmit speech to primates since primates lack the necessary vocal apparatus, but we can transmit minimal sign language. Just as importantly, individuals need to have similar cognitive landscapes. Consider that culture is opaque, meaning it's not necessarily clear which features of an artifact or behavior are meaningful and should be copied. The cognitive capacities for recognizing and imitating relevant aspects of a signal may in large part themselves be socially learned. Consider an example from the domain of language. We know that young infants are sensitive to the phonetic distinctions in languages other than their first, but by around 12 months of age they become selectively sensitive to the sounds of their first language. Toscano and McMurray modeled phoneme acquisition as an unsupervised category learning problem using a mixture of Gaussians model. A simulated individual learner begins with a number of Gaussians randomly distributed in phonetic space that are all equal in probability, which is represented by the amplitude of the Gaussian. The model is fed with phonetic data from real speakers, and after each input, the Gaussians update their parameters using Bayesian inference, and only the Gaussian that best fits the input increases in frequency, while all others decrease. We can see the model home in on the correct category structure for the voicing dimension in English, which has two categories. We can think of this process as individuals acquiring a culture-specific cognitive landscape, which can be described computationally as a set of categories that shape perception and production. In other words, individuals become cognitively aligned to their population. But importantly, treating this as an individual level learning problem assumes that the teachers, the others in the population, are already cognitively aligned with each other. But culture is a feedback loop, and as individuals generate behaviors and artifacts, these shape the cognitive landscapes of others, which can result in a new distribution of behaviors and artifacts in the next generation. So what stabilizes this process, and how do populations become cognitively aligned in the first place? 
To address this question, we adapted the category learning model from Toscano and McMurray to a group setting, which I'll show in schematic form here. We start with a fully connected network of agents. We select this agent in blue as the communicator first. Let's say blue agent has the category structure seen here, and selects one category from the repertoire to sample a signal from, which is the category highlighted in blue. The blue agent then selects the red agent as a receiver, and the red agent has a different category structure. The signal from blue is shown in the dashed blue line. So the red agent identifies the signal as belonging to the red category. Then the red agent updates their category structure in response to the new information. We then select a new agent to act as communicator, and after each agent has had a turn, one iteration is complete. Agents can die with some probability on each turn and will be replaced by a newly initialized agent. Now I'll show you our baseline model in action. In the actual model, the Gaussian mixtures were two-dimensional rather than one-dimensional as in the schematic. Each color in this plot corresponds to one agent, and each agent has multiple categories. The transparency of the points represents the amplitude of each Gaussian. The categories start out randomly distributed, but quickly begin to cluster. We can think of these as emergent cultural attractors forming. We characterize three main properties of the model's behavior, which might be relevant to the potential for cumulative cultural evolution. The first is the complexity of the population distributions, which is related to the combinatorial possibilities of the cultural repertoire. The next was stability of the distribution, or how quickly the distribution is changing over time. This may be important for things like learnability and intergenerational maintenance of information. The third was conformity, or how closely aligned individuals in the population are to each other. We expect that different distributions of knowledge might be useful for different domains. To measure complexity, we use the k-means algorithm and the gap statistic to infer the number of categories at the population level, and we looked at the Shannon entropy of that frequency distribution. To see how stable these categories were, we compared the distribution to itself over time using a similarity metric called the earth mover distance, with higher values meaning that the distribution changed more substantially across time steps, so we can call this a measure of instability. To operationalize conformity, we use the same metric to compare each individual's cognitive landscape to the category structure at the population level. This is basically a measure of how idiosyncratic or nonconformist individual category structures were on average. Now I'll briefly show you three case studies illustrating the utility of the model. First, we found that some noise is actually beneficial for the stability of these distributions. Here I'm showing the end state of the model for three levels of Gaussian noise added to transmission. And you can see that when noise is high on the right, categories tend to neatly distribute throughout the space. When transmission is noisy, categories become more diffuse, so fewer of them can be maintained in the same space. This makes the distributions less complex. But noise also slows the learning process, which makes the distributions more stable. As a result, individuals can become more closely cognitively aligned to their populations. So it appears there's a trade-off between the effect of noise on reducing complexity and the benefit of noise on increasing stability. Next, we found that longer learning times can result in decreased complexity of the attractor landscapes. Here we see the end state of the model for different expected lifespans. When lifespans are longer, moving to the right, individuals learn for a longer period of time. As you can see in the right panel, there seems to be fewer categories when learning times are long. This is due to cognitive competition between categories, so over time, individuals fit the distribution with fewer number of categories. And when this keeps happening over generations, the population distribution simplifies. We can see that effect in the first figure. Longer learning times also seem to make the population distribution only a little less stable, but they can help individuals become more closely aligned because there are fewer categories, which makes them easier to learn. We also examined the effect of adding a critical period, which was implemented by turning off learning after some number of time steps C. As you can see in the top left, the distribution is pretty messy when learning times are very short. As the critical period gets longer, we can again see that longer learning times make the population distributions less complex. But critical periods of learning that are shorter than the lifespan also make the distributions much more stable. So both of these effects suggest that too much learning can be a bad thing for cultural evolution, which might not be a great point to make to a bunch of academics. We also see a nonlinear effect of critical periods on conformity, with moderate learning times promoting the greatest alignment. We next looked at population size, which is tied up with population density in a fully connected network. 
Both of these things have been flagged as important factors for the potential for cumulative cultural evolution. We find that larger populations actually have slightly less complex category structures, but larger populations are also much more stable. However, we find a non-linear effect of population size on non-conformity, which is an interesting avenue for future work. Finally, we also explored four different network structures, including a fully connected network, a connected caveman network, a small world network, and a realistic social network. Here's the end state plot, and you can see that the connected caveman network in the top right looks very different than the others, with many tight categories. The connected caveman network produces much more complex distributions than the others, but they are all about equally stable over time. We also see much higher nonconformity in the connected caveman network. The explanation here is that the click structure of the network keeps information from diffusing broadly, so each click tends to be closely aligned within itself, but different category structures appear across clicks, allowing for many different categories to be maintained in the population without blending into more diffuse categories. Here are the key takeaways from this talk. The first is that cultural attractors are emergent products of cognitive landscapes getting aligned within a population. These categories act as a foundation on which culture can evolve, and factors at many different levels interact to influence the dynamics of a cultural attractor landscape. These include cognition, development, and population structure. Some future directions for this model include the addition of fitness constraints, integrating our model into communication games, allowing agents to produce combinations of categories, which can allow us to study things like the emergence of grammar, tool building, and storytelling, to allow for biological inheritance of cognitive capacities, and to examine prestige bias or other constraints on interaction. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions.